It's been over a month since Jay was murdered. His mother found him with a broken neck at the bottom of their staircase. Jay's head had been caved in by an unknown blunt object. I've been in hiding ever since. After all, I'm now the prime suspect in Jay's death, even though I had nothing to do with it. Not that anyone would believe me. All I can do is wait. After graduating from law school, my friends and I decided to have one last hurrah. Jay was going to work for his family's firm after passing the bar. Eric received a clerkship for a federal judge. Mike got an offer from a corporate bigwig to be his in-house counsel. I was disgusted at the thought of practicing law and was going to join a think tank after our vacation. We decided on Bangkok. It was a cheap but exotic destination. The food was great and, well, you could have some discreet fun. Jay's parents were so excited that he graduated and rented us an entire house in the Southorn district. The trip was underwhelming from the start. The locals in our neighbourhood were suspicious of us and eschewed any attempted interaction with us. It didn't help that we were drunk most of the time and raised hell long into the night. A police officer came to our rental after Mike threw a chair from the third floor and Eric had to pay a bribe to get him to leave. Pretty soon, we burned ourselves out and became bored and grumpy. Then Jay met Bandit. Bandit, we called him Bandy, was a local high school student who couldn't have been older than 18. Bandy was tiny, even by Thai standards, and had cropped black hair and a spindly prepubescent moustache. He was also comically bow-legged and would hop around when he got excited. Bandy spoke perfect English and soon became our liaison for debauchery. He brought liquor, weed, and girls to our house anytime we asked. He also refused any sort of payment. Hanging with his American pals was enough. When Bandy came to our house, he always entered the backyard to avoid detection. He would tap on the door four times and whistle like a character from Looney Tunes. Bandy loved anything America and was a more zealous patriot than his American friends. He grew up on propaganda action movies like Rocky IV and Lethal Weapon. Bandy learned English by watching those films and wanted to move to the US for college. Then he would marry an American girl and live out the rest of his days in peace and liberty. Mike joked that we could smuggle Bandy in our suitcases. We loved him that much. On our last night, we threw one final American-themed rager to show our appreciation for Bandy. This time, we handled logistics and told Bandy he could come empty-handed. We waited in anticipation of his arrival. Then we heard the sign, four knocks and a whistle. Bandy's eyes widened once he saw what we had planned for him. USA motherfuckers, he joyfully screamed and shotgunned a beer with Mike. I don't remember much from the party. I must have passed out in my room before midnight but I was frantically awakened by Eric. Dude, wake up. Bandy fell down the stairs. We raced towards the stairs and saw Bandy's body crumpled at the bottom. Jay was shuffling the girls we brought out the door. Mike was pacing back and forth like a maniac. I ran down to check on Bandy. He was still breathing, but his neck and head were contorted in a way that wasn't natural. His eyes darted around in a panic slowly coming to the realisation that he was paralysed. Well, don't just stand there, I yelled. Call an ambulance. Jay came back into the living room. Are you stupid? Adam, there's coke and weed everywhere. What are the police going to say? Eric shook his head. Fuck that. We need to get him some help now. I'm going to call an amp. Before Eric could finish his sentence, Mike came in with a hammer and bashed Bandy's head. We all froze in shock. Mike, twitching from all the cocaine, took another deep breath before bringing the hammer down on Bandy again. A sickening moment of silence followed before Eric and I started screaming. What the fuck, Mike? I yelled. What the fuck did you just do? What was I supposed to do? Mike slurred back at me. Dude was a goner. All I did was end his suffering. He then nudged Bandy's now corpse with his shoe. Eric, Jay, and I all shouted at Mike, and then argued about what to do next. Spare me your false righteousness, Mike sneered. 
We all have futures to get back to. I will not jeopardize mine. Jay sidestepped Bandy's body and walked up the stairs. He came back down with a bedsheet and threw it over Bandy. Like clockwork, we worked together in silence to get rid of the body. We wrapped Bandy tightly in a bedsheet and carried him out the back door. Eric and I drove to the pier, stuffed some rocks in Bandy's pockets and threw him into the river. His tiny body hardly made a splash. We quietly left Thailand the following day. Mike stared out the plane's window the whole flight, finally realising the gravity of his actions. We touched down in the country we called home, and the place Bandy never got to visit. Mike was the first to speak before we went our separate ways. We did what we had to do, I guess. Mike would also be the first to die. They found him almost two months after we returned from Thailand. Mike fell down the stairs, breaking his neck in three places. Police also discovered two wounds caused by blunt force trauma on his head. One of them was post-mortem. Mike's father said we were the last to see him alive. Mike's dad claimed to have only talked to Mike on the phone and commented that his behaviour seemed strange. Mike complained that he wasn't getting enough sleep and would hear odd noises at night. The night before he died, Mike made three phone calls to 911, but they were all disconnected. I skipped his funeral. Eric called me, asking why I wasn't there. I told Eric what had happened to Mike was the literal definition of karma, and I no longer considered any of us friends. Eric seemed hurt by my words, but couldn't disagree. It was best to move on from everything, no matter how difficult it could be. Before he hung up, Eric asked if I had trouble sleeping recently. I keep having these nightmares, mostly about Bandy. It's strange. Remember how we made him do a secret knock and then whistle before he walked into the house? I swear I hear it all the time. I responded that I didn't think I could remember any of my dreams since we returned from Thailand. Eric sighed but wished me the best before disconnecting the call. Eric's wife, Jessica found him at the bottom of their living room staircase a month later. His neck was twisted by the fall, and someone finished him off with a blunt object. Jessica also said that he had been acting erratically since Mike's death. Eric wasn't sleeping, and he confided in her that he felt they were being watched. I decided to go to Eric's funeral, since we were the closest. Jessica and I exchanged hollow pleasantries, and I was preparing to make a quick exit before I saw Jay. He looked like he hadn't slept in days. I went to speak to him, but he tried to rush back to his car when he saw me. I chased him, determined to know what was going on. Jay fumbled for his keys to start the car, but stopped when he realised he would have to run me over to leave. Jay, talk to me, man. What the fuck is going on? Jay looked up at me, with dark circles hanging around his eyes. He studied me before saying firmly, I need you to stop fucking with me, Adam. I slammed my hand on the top of the roof. What the hell are you talking about? Jay shook his head. I know what you're doing, Adam. I know what you're doing. He screamed so loud that the other funeral goers started walking towards us. I know it's you, Adam, Jay said again, his voice quivering. It fucking has to be you. He then shut his car door and sped off. I turned around to leave and saw Jessica behind me. What did he mean by that, Adam? Do you know what happened to Eric? Do you? I bolted back to my car and drove home. A detective called me an hour later to ask some questions about Eric. I offered some empty platitudes and hung up the phone. I didn't know what was going on with Jay, so I tried to reach out to him. But every call went to voicemail. I didn't hear from him for another week. I woke up in the middle of the night to a missed call from him. I tried to call back, but the line seemed disconnected. It was the night that Jay was murdered. The night Jay died, he left a note confessing his role in covering up Bandy's murder. He spoke about the guilt keeping him awake, and that he was suffering from PTSD. Jay also felt that someone was watching and tormenting him. Since I was the last of us left... He accused me of being the perpetrator and swore I murdered Mike and Eric. I should have turned myself in, 
I know I didn't kill my friends. I had solid alibis on the nights that they were killed. I'm not sure why I felt compelled to run and hide, but I did. I fled the state to a cabin owned by my late grandparents. My parents desperately tried to get me to turn myself in, but I felt my fate was already decided. I stayed at the cabin for a day before crossing the border and breaking into a vacant house to hide. That's when the nightmares started. They didn't feel like nightmares though, more like intense delusions. I would hear four taps on the door, followed by a loud whistle. I instinctively answered the door the first time, but no one was there. I also got an unbearable feeling that I was being watched by something. I would see shadows in the corner of my eyes and faces that I couldn't recognize popping in and out of windows. I fled the house the following day and drove until I nearly fell asleep at the wheel. I canvassed neighborhoods until I saw a home with a for sale sign. I ditched my car and broke in through the back door. I made my way to the basement and cut a crawl space in the wall to hide in case there were visitors. I slept well for the first time in what felt like ages, but the peace and quiet hasn't lasted long. I've been here for three days. I've run out of food, and my water supply is dangerously low. I have the same delusions again as I'm about to doze off. Four light taps on the door, and a loud whistle. Only this time, the whistle is followed by laughter. <laughs> At first, the laughter reminded me of Bandy, but now it's darker, more guttural. It doesn't even sound human. My mouth is so dry, and my stomach is growling. The knocking used to only happen at night time, but now it's repeating itself on a loop. The whistling has almost deafened my ears, and I can hear the laughter inside my body. <laughs> need to eat soon if I'm going to make it. I look up at the basement door, which now seems so far away. Was the staircase longer than I remembered? No. I'm having delusions again. I'm sleep deprived and starving. My mind is playing tricks on me. Why am I even here? Why don't I just leave? I've done nothing wrong. I can talk my way out of this. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. All I need to do is take the first step. Thanks for watching this video. If you want to support the channel, we have a link in the description. Don't forget to subscribe, comment, share, like, and press the bell to get notification when new videos are uploaded. You can send your real or fictional stories to the email address in the description.